to God. Good morning, KCC. It's good to see your smiling faces this morning. Pour it out on that one, didn't I? Huh? I know you're smiling underneath those masks. And uh, bless you if you're joining us online later. You're welcome. It's good to, to have you all here. Today is Palm Sunday. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about that later on. But it's good to see we've got, we've got whales represented. Gareth's flying the, the flag for Wales. Scotland will be here in a minute, I think. He's here. He's here. We've got Scotland represented. Praise God. We've got any fence netters? English. Yes. No Irish. England. Oh, is there any Irish? No Irish. Never mind. We're almost there. Are you Irish? A bit Irish. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit Irish. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. It's good to have people who are a bit Irish amongst us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So all the nations are here to praise him this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo. And uh, you may well be aware that uh, last night the Jewish people celebrated the Passover, their Seder meal. Amen. Which is always very significant. And I just wanted to share some verses of scripture with you. From 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6 onwards. <coughs> and this actually was a rebuke to the Corinthian Christians. It's not a rebuke to you, but it's a rebuke to the Corinthians. I know that you're not boasting. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 6, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. Amen? Bless the Lord. And what's all that about? Well, we know that Christ came to fulfill the type of the Passover lamb, did he not? He is our Passover lamb, and our Passover lamb has been slain. I know we're, we're a little bit out of order with the dates, but we're going to be looking towards that on Friday and then remembering the resurrection on Sunday morning. But the fact is that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been slain, has been sacrificed, and then, if you know your Bible, you know that the, the Jewish people were to eat for seven days unleavened bread. Unleavened bread, and if you know about leaven and yeast, it's what causes things to puff up, doesn't it? And that's what the, the, the comment about arrogance is about here, right? And, and sin and pride and so on. And so, the idea is that we now, just in, in the same way that the Jewish people do not eat unleavened bread for seven days, that we also make sure there's no leaven in our lives, that we clear out the house, so to speak, of the leaven, the sin that grieves God. Amen? Bless the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, we just glorify your holy name. We worship you. We thank you for this new day. We thank you for this Palm Sunday, Lord, and all that it represents, Father, all that it speaks to us of. We're going to look into that later, Lord, but right now we just want to come before you. Lord, we want to present ourselves before you. Lord, we are your inheritance, Lord. You, you saved us. You purchased us. You redeemed us with the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord. You qualify us this morning to stand in your presence, Lord. Lord, we're not standing, Lord, in our own merits, Lord, our, our own, Lord, performance, Lord, but we're standing because you qualify us to stand, Lord. Amen. We say thank you. Thank you for all that you are, Lord, and all that you do. Have your way in this place this morning, Father, Amen. and be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand? Amen. We're going to worship the Lord. Amen. And that two parts of the day, you know, cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David, which means praise the Lord. Amen. So praise is rising. Here we go.
Jesus. Bless your name. Thank you, Lord. Lord, just be glorified in this place. Amen. That's the cry of our hearts, Lord, that we love you. You're everything to us, Lord. Just receive this offering of praise this morning, Father. Receive it, Lord. Hallelujah. In the holy and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Bless you. Thank you. Hallelujah. If you can try and take your seats. Wow. Yes. Amen. Amen. It's good to worship God. It's good to praise Him. It's good to fill this place with His praises. When I'm what we're about to, to speak into this morning, you know, I just imagine that, that that same atmosphere of praise on that day as Jesus, Yeshua, rode into Jerusalem. Amen? So I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles in Luke chapter 19. Luke 19. And we're going to read from verse 28 through to verse 44. Luke 19, 28 through 44. Hallelujah. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Amen. And Lord, we just say thank you for your word this morning. Lord, help us to step into your word. Help us to visualize that scene on that day, Lord, that, that eventful day, that significant day. Lord, I pray you'll speak to us again through the scriptures. Lord, open the eyes of our understanding. Lord, we might hear your voice, that we might comprehend it, Lord, and that we might apply it. Help us to see the lessons you want to teach us this morning, Lord. We just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, as I've just said, and, and I'm sure you're the same, whenever we read these passages, I like to visualize the scene. Wow. And, and just take, you can go there, friends. You weren't there, but you can go there in your mind's eye. And I want you to imagine that scene. Jesus and the disciples, they'd finished their ministry up in the region of the Galilee. 
and then made their way south through the region of Perea, and then they crossed the Jordan, and we, we can read just prior to this incident, Jesus was near Jericho, and we hear that he, he healed the two blind men. Remember the two blind men? The Gospels tend to focus on one that we call Bartimaeus. He's identified, but Jesus opens the eyes of the blind men, and then he goes into Jericho, and he's met by Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus comes to the knowledge of Jesus as well. Salvation comes to his house. And then we're told that Jesus and the disciples begin to make their way up to Jerusalem. And you always make your way up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is, is nestled in the hills. Okay? So you always make your way up. Don't make the mistake that I made once. And Johnny was with me in Capernaum talking to a Jew and telling him we were going down to Jerusalem. And he, uh, he, he was swift to correct my, my understanding. But uh, yes, we always go up to Jerusalem. Je Jesus was heading up to Jerusalem. It's a journey of about 17, 18 miles, I believe. Um, and up through into the, the, the desert mountains, you know. It's a, it's a journey and a half, really. And if ever you come with me to Israel, we're gonna, we won't, probably won't take that exact road, but you'll see what we mean by that terrain. And so Jesus... He makes his way up with his disciples. And as he comes to the village of Bethany, remember Bethany was the village where his friends lived. Remember his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who he'd raised from the dead. And we hear about another village that was very close by. I pronounce, or we, we're supposed to pronounce as Beth Parge, but I bet, I bet most of us say Beth Page, don't we, or something like that. Apparently, it's, it's, the, it's the place of the unripened figs, whatever that meant. Beth Parge. But it was another village that was close by. And so Jesus apparently stayed with his friends, Lazarus and Martha and Mary and Bethany. But he sent his disciples into a village opposite and were told to get the colt of a donkey. One that had never been ridden, a, a, a young donkey that had never been ridden before. And friends, we can easily just gloss over that part of the text. But actually, if you, if you pay attention, you'll see something of the omniscience of God revealed through Jesus, that he would know that that colt was there. And he said, you know, to untie the colt and bring it to me. If they ask you, tell them the Lord needs it. And that's exactly what happened. And the scriptures tell us that they brought back the donkey and they laid their cloaks on him as if it were a saddle of some sort. And he sat upon the donkey and his disciples began to go with him as they uh, passed down onto the Roman road. And you can actually, you can visit there these days. You can go down the Mount of Olives on Palm Sunday, on today actually. I'm not sure there'll be tourists, but I'm sure there'll be some church folk who are doing the, the traditional route of the Palm Sunday, the entrance into Jerusalem. And so I just want you to imagine the scene. I can imagine the dust flicking up. You know, I can imagine the commotion. Imagine the, 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 the crowds that were gathering around this man they'd seen. And many of them had witnessed what had happened in Bethany when Lazarus was raised from the dead. You know, Jerusalem was astir with the, with the, with the, the, the miracles that had happened. They'd heard about him in all over Galilee. They didn't know who he was, but they knew he was, they thought he was the prophet from Nazareth. The prophet, the Galilean from Nazareth. And so Jesus is entering into that, that kind of that situation. People are coming out from Jerusalem. People are wondering what's going on. There's a stir, everything's stirred. There's expectation in the air. The, the, the atmosphere is charged with praise, just like our atmosphere was charged with praise. But what can we understand? It's a shame that just a few days later, this whole episode would end in tragedy. It was a tragedy for that generation of Jews, but it actually turned out to be a great blessing for us who are sitting here today 2,000 years on, isn't it? Praise God. We're going to reflect on those events that took place just a few days later, in, in a few days' time. But what can we learn this morning from this, this particular incident? Well, we can see that it was a day of completion. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of flick through the different, the, 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 the four Gospels all recount this episode, all recount this event. Okay, very important. So you can read it in Matthew 21. Mark 11, Luke 19, and John chapter 12. And like many other incidents, you'll see that the writers of the Gospels, they give you their, their, their perspective from different angles, focusing on different points. And you can see 
And in Matthew 21 and verse 4, we see that everything had to take place just as the prophets had prophesied. You see, this day was a day of completion. It was a day of completion. We, we read about this, this wonderful procession riding into Jerusalem, but we need to think about the fact that it was three years of ministry. Was, it was coming to a culmination. Three years of ministry. Three years he'd been ministering around the Galilee. He'd been down to, to Judea before. He'd been in the Piraean region. He'd been all over the land ministering, proclaiming the kingdom of God, healing the sick, raising the dead, open the eyes of the blind. Hallelujah. Letting the lame walk. He'd made it so clear who he was. The Holy Spirit of God was attesting to the fact that this was the Messiah. And yet eyes were blind to that fact. It's, it's difficult to imagine, isn't it, as we, we read through the story, but we can see it was all part of God's sovereign plan for the salvation of mankind. The fact is, the appointed time was approaching. The appointed time was approaching. The time for his death and his resurrection was approaching. <clears throat> and Jesus had prepared himself for this moment. Jesus had prepared himself for this moment. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, he says, At the time approached for, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messages on ahead who went into Samaritan village to get things ready for him, but the people there did not welcome him, welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. You know, and as we reflect over those past three years, and we think about the times that Jesus faced trials and difficulties. Imagine, you know, everybody that you'd known growing up wanting to throw you off a cliff in Nazareth. All that you'd known, all your friends that you used to play, imagine them turning on you because you'd made a claim that you are the Messiah. And then you think about the rejection that he felt, that he received from his own disciples. Remember in John chapter 6, there's a point where he actually says to the disciples, are you going to leave me too? Are you going to? Just because he challenged the crowds about their motivation for following him. He knew there was somebody who was in the crowd of the disciples who would betray him. There were so many opportunities. And we need to remember this, friends. The fact is that Jesus was faithful until the end. Jesus was completely submitted to the will of the Father and everything had to take place just as it had been prophesied. Just as it was prophesied. Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He resolutely set out for Jerusalem, even knowing what was coming. Secondly, he prepared the disciples. He was walking with a bunch of guys who didn't comprehend totally who he was, nor the plan of God. It says in Luke 9.21, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. That's what he was making clear to the disciples. This is my purpose. This is what will happen to me in Jerusalem. Prepare your hearts. Prepare yourselves. And I imagine the disciples just, it was just going over their heads. They wouldn't understand it. For them, the kingdom of God was here. Jesus would ride into Jerusalem and establish his millennial kingdom in the earth. But they've gotten things wrong. And then we're told that the disciples prepared the way. We just heard that they, they were sent out to bring a colt in. Why? Verse 4 of Matthew 21. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. Or by the prophets. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. Matthew 21 verse 5. Matthew 21 verse 5. Rejoice. Greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And we need to understand here that, that Matthew is quoting, in Matthew 21 verse 5, is quoting the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9. I think most of us recognize that, don't we? We're seeing it wasn't that Jesus was a bit tired and he just needed a bit of a lift to, to ride into Jerusalem. No, it was actually fulfilling the Scriptures. That the prophecies that might be fulfilled concerning him. 
It was also spoken of in Isaiah 62, verse 11. Friends, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, the King, the Holy One of Israel, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. That was a sign of peace. You see, the truth is that one day he's going to ride in again, but he's not going to ride in on a donkey as a sign of peace. He's going to ride in on a white horse as a conquering king to establish his throne in Jerusalem to rule over the nations. The millennial kingdom we refer to it as. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the nations will go up to Jerusalem once a year to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And they'll bring all the glory of the nations into the holy city of Jerusalem. And the King of Kings is seated on the throne of David in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, <laughs> I love talking about these things. I do. What can we learn this morning from this wonderful day of completion, this day of consummation, of fulfillment, of prophecy? It's the beginning of the end of the ministry of Jesus in the earth, displaying his faithfulness. First, it was a triumph of faithfulness. We call it the triumphal entry, don't we? And you wonder, why was it triumphal entry when we know that he was going to be rejected and within a few days he would be crucified? It was a triumph of his faithfulness. It was a triumph of his, of his victory, friends. Oh, his, 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 his faithfulness. He was faithful to the very end. He was bringing his mission to completion. He had persevered despite all the challenges and he would continue to do so through the coming week. He overcame that we might overcome. He said, didn't he? He says, you can rest assured that in this world, you will have tribulation. But be encouraged. Be of good courage because I have overcome the world. And we're in a situation right now where we need to overcome. I know many of us are weary. We're tired. We're confused. You know, we just want to get back to some kind of normality. But we need to keep pressing on. We need to keep pressing on. We need to take courage and overcome this tribulation. We need to persevere in that which the Lord has given us to do. Jesus resolutely set himself towards Jerusalem. He set his face towards Jerusalem. He knew what was coming, and yet he persevered. How we so need to seek the Lord. Lord, give me consistency. Teach me to be consistent in my walk with you. Because it's easy, isn't it, when, we're, when everything's going well and we can, we can remember God's blessings and we see His blessings upon our lives and we're feel, feeling good about things. It's great to come and worship God and you just feel that release to worship God. But then when you start to hit the hard times and people are giving you a hard time, you might be facing rejection or tribulation or trial or whatever, and we get, we get so discouraged. And I'm not, I'm not in any way diminishing, you know, how serious that is. I know we're all different and we all react differently. But the thing is, we can find consistency as we walk in His Spirit. Lord, help us to persevere. Persevere, to keep going. Let us remember your example. Let us remember everything that you went through. You know, until the very end, He was obedient. Obedient. He persevered and He was faithful in His obedience. James 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man and woman, of course, who remains steadfast under trial, who perseveres, who keeps going. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Secondly, it was a day of completion, but it was a day of expectation. Expectation. Luke chapter 19, verse 37. Imagine the scene. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they'd seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
And again, if you look from Matthew's perspective in, verse, in chapter 21 and verse 9, we see they're crying out, Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. And I want you to imagine that. The crowd's crying out in Hebrew, Hosanna! Hosanna! What does that mean? It means save now! Save now! And by crying out those words, they were recognizing that this is God's Messiah. This is the Messianic King. And there was, the whole atmosphere was charged with expectation. The Bible tells us in John chapter 12 and verse 12, John's perspective, that they began to wave palm branches. Palm branches. Now this is very interesting. Because as they began to wave palm branches, we remember... The instructions in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 40, which speaks about the, 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 the Feast of Tabernacles. They were to wave palm branches during the Feast of Tabernacles. So we've got people, remember, this was not Tabernacles. Remember the feast that it was? Passover. Passover was coming. And yet they were celebrating as if it was tabernacles. Why? Because tabernacles looks forward to the millennial reign. Looks forward to the kingdom of God. And so we get a taste, we get an understanding, some insight into what they were expecting that day. What they were celebrating, they were beginning to celebrate as if like at the Feast of Tabernacles was being fulfilled because the king was going to ride into Jerusalem, overthrow the Romans and establish the kingdom. Wow. Hosanna. Hallelujah. To the son of David, the Davidic king. He who was born of the line of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, that is from Psalm 118 and verse 25 to 26. And there is a group of psalms called the Hallel Psalms. The Hallel Psalms. Psalms 113 through 118. And again... It's interesting that these Hallel Psalms at the time of Jesus, they were sung during the Feast of Tabernacles. They were celebrating as if the Feast of Tabernacles were being fulfilled, as if the kingdom had finally arrived. The atmosphere was charged with messianic expectation. You know what? They expected deliverance. They expected deliverance. Now I'm going to surprise you. This was not the first time that they'd waved palm branches and cried out, Hosanna. It's not the first time. You see, more or less a hundred and odd years previous to this, there was a guy called Judas Maccabeus. You may have re read some of his book, The Maccabeans, about that Maccabean revolt. And they actually hailed him as if he was the Messiah because he conquered the Syrians. And so they were doing exactly the same. It wasn't the first time that it happened. And yet the crowds were crying out that same thing, Hoshianna, Hoshianna, hallelujah. Friends, what can we glean from this? What lessons can we glean? Well, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that their expectation was based upon God's faithfulness. He had already demonstrated through many mighty works. Let's look again, verse 37. It says, when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices. For what? For all the miracles they had seen. The disciples were praising, whether they understood what was about to happen or not, they were praising God for all the miracles that they had witnessed. Friends, what can we learn from that? That we must not lose sight of all that God has done for us. Wow. You know, the Lord instructed his people in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. And he's instructing the people of Israel, don't forget the great things that I've done for you. Don't forget the miracles. Don't forget the, the, the great deliverance and the redemption. And it's the same lesson for us, friends. Don't forget what I've done for you. 
Psalm 103 verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Remember His faithfulness. Let us always rejoice in the great things that God has done for us. It is not just for the sake of praising Him, but to remind ourselves of what He's going to do. <laughs> oh. I don't know tell you. So I used to walk miles in Brazil in the pulpit. I think I'm going to have to put a belt around. Never mind. <clears throat> Friends, if we've lost our expectation, we have probably lost sight of what He has done. We've forgotten His faithfulness in our own lives. Don't lose sight of what He's done for you so that you don't lose expectation of what He's going to do. Amen. There's times when we need to stop. Because it's easy to forget, isn't it? We get caught up in so many things. But time to, to stop and reflect and think about the things that God has done for us in our lives. Reflect on those things. And let them encourage you that God is faithful and He'll con continue that work in your life. Hallelujah. The third thing that we see, verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The third thing we see is that it was a day of indignation. It was a day of indignation. The Pharisees, they were angry at what they were seeing and what they were hearing. Yes? It was tragic. They were happy for Jesus to be referred to as a rabbi. But now he was being received as the messianic king. Now they were starting to cry out things that, that related to the, the son of David, the messianic king. Oh no. Teacher, rabbi, rebuke your disciples. Shut them up. Rebuke your disciples. You know, we see again, and I'm not saying, please, the Pharisees, all the way through the ministry of Jesus, we see that they were the, the greatest antagonists of his ministry. They thought they were fulfilling their responsibilities. But actually, God, the Son, was right in front of them. The Spirit of God was attesting to the fact this was Messiah, and they missed it. And not only that, you see, not just on that day, but there were other moments where they were rejecting him, and they were plotting to kill him. They even plotted to kill Lazarus again. So Jesus responds by telling them that it was good and right to proclaim truth. You see, as much as they wanted to silence the truth, there was no way it was going to happen. Jesus said, hey, if these don't cry out, the very stones will cry out. I don't think that he was saying that, you know, the stones would literally cry out, friends, by the way. I think it's like a proverb or something. And he's basically saying, look, it's good and proper that they cry out because what they cry out is according to truth. It is who I am. Hallelujah. Friends, for some, the truth brings elation, doesn't it? For others, indignation. We want to proclaim the truth. You need to know that sometimes you're going to bring that truth to people and they're going to be delighted at what you share with them. They're going to have ears to hear you, but there are others who are going to get very, very angry with what you're saying. And right now, society is, is saying, Rabbi, a teacher, shut, shut them up. Because we don't believe in what they're crying out. We don't accept what they're saying. What are we going to do? John 15 verse 18 says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Friends, as we move forward, and as the society moves further and further away from God and from His will and from His word, we need to understand that we're going to hear these words as well. Shut up. Don't say that. I don't like it. It challenges me. I don't agree with it. I don't believe in it. Be quiet. And the Lord says, my people, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. There's great pressure to conform to the thinking, the twisted, and it is twisted and distorted. The twisted thinking of this generation. 
And that's trying to pressure the church into it. And some people are falling into this. And all we're doing is we're losing our authority. Not all of us, of course. We're losing our authority to speak truth into this generation. Because we think we need to be relevant. Ah. The words, do not fear the rejection of men. Oh my goodness, this is through the scriptures. Isn't it? Don't fear the rejection of men. Fear God. Fear God. And the church needs to rediscover the fear of God instead of the fear of man. Final, finally, it was a day of misconception. A day of misconception. Oh, goodness me. Help us, Lord. Verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And at the same time that the disciples were crying out, Hosanna, and the people were beginning to, to stir it, you know, in Jerusalem and say, oh, this is the prophet from Galilee and so on. Jesus knew exactly what they were going to do. And the word says that actually, while they were crying out, Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem. If you'd only knew the things that would bring you peace. He says, in, I think it's Matthew, in Matthew's version, I think it is, and he says, I long to gather you as a hen gathered at chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You will not see me again until you learn to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let me tell you, one day, a generation of, of Israelites will cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Scriptures tell us that. They'll turn. They'll turn. And they will receive Yeshua, Jesus, as their Messiah. Truthfully, honestly. Hallelujah. As Jesus rode in, they expected him to turn towards the Antonia Fortress, which is a Roman fortress, that was built on the side of the, of the temple complex so the Romans could keep, they have a garrison of, of soldiers in there, could keep an eye on the, on the temple and everything that was going on in the camp complex. Of course, these people, the Jer Jerusalemites, they were expecting him to go in, to go in, over to the Roman fortress, to overthrow the Romans, to begin the revolt. It didn't happen. Mark's gospel tells us that he went. He came in, had a look around and went out. Went and stayed in Bethany. And we're told that he went the next day and cleansed the temple. You see, instead of dealing with the Romans, he started to deal with the Jews. And cleansed the temple. And then we can work, work our way through the last week. We call it Holy Week as it builds up and it culminates in the crucifixion and then the resurrection. Oh, we'll get there. You see, although it was a day of crying out, a day of praise and exaltation and expectation, it was also a day of misconception. In spite of all the commotion, the cries that would ring out over Jerusalem a few days later would be, Crucify! Crucify him! This man's no Messiah. Crucify him. Jesus knew it. In the following verses, he talks very specifically about a siege that took place in the year A.D. 70. And if you cast your mind a few days later when Jesus is carrying his cross through the streets of Jerusalem and the women are weeping, he says, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. You see, judgment was coming upon that generation. That generation of Israelites, as a, whole, as a majority, rejected the Messiah King Jesus. And judgment came because they rejected him. And in AD 70, under the leading of, of, of General Titus, Jerusalem was besieged. You can read about it, all about in your history books. And it was terrible. The things that took place were terrible. And four legions, I believe, eventually went into Jerusalem and did what they did. Carried off the temple treasures, set the place alight, began to remove stone by stone. In fact, when you go to Jerusalem with me, you're going to see some of these stones that Jesus was talking about because they still lie there. They're still there. They've been excavated, and you can see the piles of stones that Jesus of Nazareth was talking about. 
Judgment came upon that generation in AD 70. But God is faithful. God is faithful. And one day, as I said, those people will turn and see the Messiah. They'll recognize. Hallelujah. They'll mourn for him who they pierced. Hallelujah. Zechariah tells us about that. What do we learn, friends? The final lesson this morning. These first century, this first century generation allowed their disillusionment to breed hatred towards their king, Jesus. We must be careful to go on trusting. We must be careful to go on trusting him. Even when he does not fulfill our specific expectations. I don't know about you in your walk with the Lord, but there have been times when I've expected him to do something and he hasn't done it. Or he's done something completely different. And at that particular moment, you can throw your toys out the pram and have a Barney, or you can begin to trust him. Lord, I do not understand. Things have not worked out the way that I thought they should or would. But you know what? I trust you. You're God. And that's where we grow. That's where we grow. That's where we mature. It's not when, when things work out, when the Lord's answering your prayers the way you think he should. It's when things don't work out the way that you think they should or I think they should. And then you need to trust him. And that's where we need to grow, friends. That's where we need to trust him. The Lord says in Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Oh, help us. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. I don't understand, Lord, but I trust you. And you know what? I submit to you. The truth is that God has a perfect plan. And we've been called to seek and to submit to it. Not to try and conform him to my plan, but for us to be conformed to his plan and his will. Amen? Conclude, we're called to what? Persevere. Persevere. Keep going. Keep going. Be obedient no matter what. Secondly, we must dwell upon his faithfulness in our past, everything he's done for us, and expect it into the future. Don't lose sight of what he's done so that you don't lose your expectation of what he's going to do. Amen? Thirdly, we should remain faithful in proclaiming truth no matter what. Don't let the Pharisees shut you up, so to speak. Keep proclaiming truth. Fourth, we must trust him even when we do not fully comprehend his ways when it doesn't work out the way you think it should amen bless the lord praise god in a few few days time we're gonna we're gonna reflect on the rest of the the events of that week let's just bow our heads and our hearts in his presence right now father we glorify your name we honor you lord lord we thank you for these important crucial lessons that you've shared with us this morning through your word Father. As we reflect upon that day that day when the king truly rode into Jerusalem, Lord, but it was meant to be, Lord, it was going to be a journey of tragedy, Lord. Even though we refer to it as triumph, Lord. Lord, it was tragedy from our perspective, but it was triumph from yours. Lord, we thank you for, for the faithfulness, the perseverance of our Lord Jesus. Lord, that he went right the way to the cross for us. Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. We're sitting here today because he was faithful. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning, Lord. I pray no matter where they're at, Lord, whatever they're going through, Father, they would know your strength this morning. They'd look and remember your faithfulness. Not forget your benefits, Lord, and expect your faithfulness into the future. Help us to trust you, Lord, no matter what, Lord. Help us to keep praising you. Help us to keep proclaiming truth, no matter what we're, we're told not to do, Lord. I just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. We're going to worship the Lord a little more. Amen. Thank you, Robert. That was great. That was super. I was really expecting you to really get going in the millennium then. I was like, come on. <laughs> I knew you couldn't, but I'm like that sometimes. Amen. She was stand. I hope you don't mind my indulging myself. Next Sunday, I'm not leaving worship anywhere. And this song is one of my favourite Resurrection Sunday songs. So I hope you don't mind me doing it today, because <laughs> I absolutely love it. <laughs>
James God. <laughs> Got me going again. <laughs> my arms last week, this week's my hips. <laughs> Woo. We'll get to my legs in a bit. <laughs> Please take your seats. How am I supposed to ask you to sit down after that? No? Okay. Bless the Lord. Just to thank you guys. Thank you. Awesome stuff. Yes. So give me a round of applause. Yeah, thank you. Bless you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, just when you'd opened the Facebook page to look at all the notices, and then it goes off. <laughs> Let me see. Of course, anyway, but let's have a look. All right. What, whilst this is kind of like winding up, um, just to let you know, there are some Why Jesus pamphlets on the back there. It's a really good opportunity this time of the year, isn't it, to, to get out and to give people information, you know, remind them of what this is really all about. Amen? So please help yourself. Give them to your neighbors. Give them to friends. Oh, come on. <laughs> Bless the Lord. I will tell you that tonight, I remember that bit, Tonight, 6.30, on Zoom, we have a prayer and communion service. Yes. Come on. <laughs> and then tomorrow night, there's men's life group on, at 7.30 on Zoom. Tuesday, 7.30, Kath's life group. Um, Wednesday, 7.30, prayer and praise. Prayer and praise. Thursday you can have off. Friday, have you got it? Oh man, you're a star. Thank you. I've done it, no, I've done it, that's right. I've done two more things. Have a look. I can't see it, but anyway, Friday, yeah, Friday, good Friday. Good Friday. Okay, good Friday. Three o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to have a time of reflection and most importantly, communion. Okay, so please, if you haven't booked in yet, make sure you book in. And let's have a, a blessed time in the presence of God, a time of reflecting upon what he's done. Uh, and then, it doesn't stop there, does it? Because on Sunday morning, we have Resurrection Day. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay? Glory to God. We can celebrate the empty tomb. And I can assure you, I've been there and it's still empty. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Um, you'll see on the notices, we've got Bible study on Zoom down for next Sunday night. It's not actually, we're not having a, a meeting on Sunday night, okay? So you can sit down and eat your Easter eggs or whatever, or if you don't want them, if you've got too many, you know where to bring them, do you? I'm already in trouble because I had a bit of a chocolate attack last night. <laughs> there you go. She was having a bit of a go at me last night. That lint, you know the lint? Sinful. Amen. I think that's everything. Shall we pray? Let's just give God thanks. Father, we say thank you, Lord, for all that you have done this morning. Thank you for your presence in our midst. And Lord, once again, Lord, I pray and ask your blessing upon each and every one of us here present this morning. Those who are joining us, Lord, online later. Lord, every household that is represented, I pray your protection and your blessing through this coming week, Father God. Lord, help us to reflect on what we've heard this morning. Lord, and to, to put into practice the, the lessons that we've been taught from your word. Help us to look forward, Father, to Friday and Sunday to come, Lord, and all that you're going to show us and do in us, Father. Father God, we just say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you all. Have a blessed afternoon and see you tonight, Zoom. Amen? Amen.